Hello everyone, welcome to What If Deku Becomes the Psychotherapist Villain Part 1. Welcome to the Villain Rehabilitation Center. It was all over. Somehow they got defeated. No more Nomis, they were all destroyed. All the research was burned. The person in charge of the Nomis was the only one who was executed. Meanwhile, it just left the eight of them standing in front of a starch, white building in the middle of nowhere. No civilians in more than a hundred mile radius. Each one of them wore heavy-duty quirk erasing cuffs that did not allow any sort of foul play with their quirks at all. Each one of them had the cuffs on the wrist, ankle, and neck. Barely couldn't imagine what would happen to them, but this kind of solution was nothing they thought about. All for one was taken to a maximum security prison. Everyone just wanted the names gone. And that left them all alone. They couldn't get away since they captured Kurajiri first with the help of Red Riot and Ground Zero. After that, no matter how fast they ran, the pro heroes got to them faster. Then all eight of the members of the League of Villains were brought to court. And somehow through all the crimes they committed, they were able to not go to prison if they just tested a new method of turning villains into civilians. Apparently the retired pro hero All Might suggested it instead of the jail time. They didn't know how to feel, but they ended up here. Here in the middle of nowhere. Firstly, the police and pro heroes placed them in quirk-resistant cuffs. Secondly, the pro heroes led them to a marked off the van, fit for transporting villains to prison. Lastly, they drove days to get to some place in the mountains to this building that they were standing in front of now. They thought someone would change the heroes' minds and not end up with the untested method. But that didn't happen. A three-story western-inspired house painted white with grey trim. The windows, they believed, had to be made of bulletproof glass. It looked very out of place with the dark wood surrounding it. Shigaraki looked at the place in disgust and scratched part of his neck that wasn't blocked by the cuff. Hoga squealed about how cute it was in her eyes. Oh my god. It's like a little dollhouse. Why said raising an eyebrow, his mask still on. Yeah, it seems like it. No, it most certainly doesn't. Kurajiri form wavered, his quirk didn't really work well with the cuffs. It still allowed his gas form to hold together, but he couldn't make portals anytime soon. I suggest we make the most out of this. I just hope they have some kind of a bar. I need to mix myself a drink. Abi scowled at the house, he didn't want to be controlled ever again. Spinner looked impassively at the building. A. Hey. He said while shrugging his shoulders. Magni retorted, at least they could have made it a different color. All this monochrome isn't doing it for me. Mr. Compress stared at the building. Let's hope we can all just get out of here soon. They all agreed by nodding at his statement. Whoever was going to try to control them would face them in battle. All of a sudden the front door opened to give view to who would be in charge of the eight villains. Hello. I'm Midoriya Izuku. You can call me Deku if you want. I'm going to be your caretaker for now. Pleased to meet you all. Deku replied at seeing them. He bowed before straightening himself to smile at them. They all stared him up and down to see if he was any danger to them. Green curly hair, freckles, big emerald eyes, and a smile to cure cancer. How is he supposed to handle them? Mr. Compress. Izuku didn't really know what to expect when he decided to become a hero for villains. Maybe he always sympathized with some that could actually be saved if someone made the right choice. Either way, he studied his way through college and became what he is today. He wouldn't say he is a therapist or anything like that. It is more like he knows how to read someone from the endless years of bullying his quirkless status got him. He knew what the other person was feeling and hiding. He could read them like a book before they even made a move. He filled notebooks on their behavior and their quirks. He knew strengths, weaknesses, likes, dislikes, and he did it all very well. So well, he got recognized by Nedzu in the middle of his college sophomore year. He became connected to the hero world in ways he never thought possible. He became several things for them. A quirk analyst to make them wiser and stronger. A therapist to talk to them about their problems and how they could fix them. A friend to many who saw him as a cinnamon roll. He didn't know what that was about, but he liked the sound of it. Izuku didn't know he got a specific assignment until his childhood friend pointed him into a new program they were going to try out. A villain rehab. He shrugged at the idea before continuing with the assignment. Turns out he gets to move away from civilization too. Oh yeah, sign him up. As long as the place has Wi-Fi. So he moved into a nice three-story building in the middle of nowhere with enough food for the apocalypse. And there he waited until the villains came in. The League of Villains. Thank God he didn't have to deal with the other three and the big one. He just had to deal with eight of them. He pulled up the profiles on each one and the notes he made with it. Name. Dobby. Work. Cremation. Grants him the ability to generate blue flames from his body with minimal effort. His flames are extremely hot, and it is believed their temperature and intensity are higher than that of normal fire since of their color. Hot enough to burn an entire group of people to ash in mere seconds. Dobby can also combust anything he touches. And create fireballs, flamethrower tracks, a burst of fire, and able to generate massive walls of fire to surround his targets. 
Dobby's body has a low tolerance for his own flames, and his body will get burned if he uses them for prolonged periods of time. Notes. Personality is stoic and aloof. He is confident in his abilities and focused when it comes to fighting. Shown to be very sadistic with his fighting. According to research, he spares families or humans who suffered because of heroes and villains alike. Dangerous. Name. Togahimiko. Work. Grants her the ability to take on the exact physical appearance of another individual by ingesting their blood. She also can copy and change their clothes by getting naked before the transformation. If not, her clothes would ruin the disguise. She can shift between many disguises if she has consumed different people's blood. Notes. Drains blood of her victims. Dangerous. Name. Kurajiri. Work. Warp gate. Can create and manipulate a dark fog that acts as a portal. When he makes a mass of the fog, it transports anything to a nearby location. He can create multiple exit points. It is based on coordinates, so he can teleport as long as he knows where it's going. Notes. Shown to be very polite and well-spoken dealing with heroes. Very level-headed, very loyal and level-headed. Dangerous. Name. Seiko Adashira Mr. Compress. Quirk. Compress. Allows him to compress anything into a small marble without actually damaging it. The weight is also reduced, making it easy to carry. If used on a person, it traps them and allows him to abduct them. The quirk can be used to select body parts. Notes. Left arm prosthetic. He is a showman that loves to monologue. He is very talkative and arrogant towards heroes. A master at agility and stealth. Dangerous. Name. Hikiyashi Kenji Magni. Quirk. Magnetism. Allows her to magnetize people around her within a 4.5 meter radius. She could magnetize a person's entire body or specific limbs. Men are polarized south and women are polarized north. Quirk does not allow her to magnetize herself. Notes. She has garnered a reputation for herself as a B-rank villain. Nine armed robberies, three murders, and 29 attempted murders. Dangerous. Name. Gubega Warajin twice. Quirk. Double. Grants him the ability to create clones of anything he touches, only two clones at a time. After memorizing the measurements and characteristics of his target, he can create a perfect copy of them. The clones need to take a moderate degree of damage before they melt into a mud-like substance. Twice has no control over the clones. Notes. Most wanted by the government because of all the thefts he has gotten away with. Very acrobatic. Appears to have some sort of identity disorder from the way he contradicts himself and that he has to have his mask on to be comfortable. Dangerous. Name. Iguchi Scoochie Spinner. Quirk. Gecko. Gives him to a lizard-like appearance and the ability to stick on walls. Notes. Talented in throwing knives and his sword of choice. Based on questioning by video camera evidence on streets, the only method of learning how to drive was from video games. Dangerous. Name. Shimura Tenko Shigaraki Tamura. Quirk. Decay. Allows him to disintegrate whatever he touches with his hands. The disintegration will spread through their whole body if a victim doesn't amputate the decaying body part. His quirk has improved and has become much faster. His quirk can even spread to targets he isn't touching, allowing him to disintegrate large groups of enemies quickly. The K will only work when all five of his fingers touch the target, Tamura has to be careful with his hands when touching objects he doesn't want to destroy. It is possible to counter it through manipulation of fluids or particle, since it only works on actual solid objects. Notes. Very analytical and has a sharp mind. Has a sinister and warped sense of mind. When left alone, he seems to mellow down. The leader of the League of Villains. Very dangerous. Ah, so these were the people he was dealing with. Odd, what did he sign up for? The sound of the bus that was supposed to drop off the villains tomorrow pulled up when he finished that thought. Oh great, let's go greet them. Oh boy, I hope they don't kill me. Izuku thought, mentally preparing himself for anything to happen. Well, this is kind of awkward Izuku thought as he looked at the villains that were seated in the living room area. He was at being in the open kitchen watching them looking around curiously. He was grateful and worried about the cuffs that instructed their quirks. I know that they are supposed to keep it on to prevent them from escaping, but it looks so uncomfortable. So. The villains all turned to stare at him with hate-filled eyes. How's it going? Izuku asked, hoping that the atmosphere might lessen with an easy icebreaker. I don't know. Everything that we worked for is pretty much done with. Our whole purpose of doing this got stopped by no good fake heroes. We have our quirks taken away from us by these constricting pieces of junk metal. We are being used as an example of the hero society's own enjoyment. Then we have to get stuck with a random nobody in the middle of nowhere and for them to try to help us be better people. How are you feeling, bitch? Dobby ranted, glaring his eyes at the therapist that they were all assigned. They all muttered agreement and nodded along to what he was saying. Izuku uneasily mumbled back, I was feeling okay, you know. Before that happened Izuku left out from his answer, what is the point of all this? You can't help us. 
Shigaraki rasped out at the plain looking boy. I'm here to try. That's the whole purpose of why I'm here. Izuku argued back at the leader. Why should we even listen to what you have to say? You will just be like the other ones who tell us to be normal and fit into the mold of society norms. So why bother? Magni remarked with Toga nodding at her words. Toga replied with her own, yeah, I have had enough of people trying to force me to be normal by their own standards. I was finally free to be myself before the heroes ruined it for me. So yeah. This guy was only useful for his blood. She thought to herself. Izuku swallowed before opening his mouth to retort. How about I go first to test your abilities? Mr. Compress proposition to the frozen therapist. What? Izuku asked in confusion. What? The League of Villains yelled in utter disbelief. Go and get your little setup done before I come to see how well you think you can do. Mr. Compress replied, getting up from his seat. Um, okay. See you then, Izuku answered nervously as he made his way to the office. Seiko waved as he watched the curly green-haired man vanish down the hallway to the last door. What the fuck, man? Spinner Whisper yelled to Mr. Compress. I'm going to distract him. You guys try to find a way out of here in these cuffs if any. Try to find some evidence on who this guy is or find anything at all about this whole thing while I'm gone. Literally, find anything you can. Seiko whispered as the headache of having to deal with a pest started to crawl into his mind. Seiko started to walk in the direction of the office before turning around to deliver the last message to his friends. Don't fuck this up. Seiko mouthed silently before continuing in his short journey to where Izuku was waiting. The League of Villains looked at each other. I'm ready to mess up some shit. How about you? Dobby asked. Hell yeah. Spinner said. Seiko looked at the layout of Mr. Midoriya's office. Simple. Plain. Ordinary. All the adjectives could fit most of the office. He sat on a light neutral green sofa decorated with blue throw pillows. The round carpet underneath a white rectangle table was cream. His therapist sat in front of him on an identical couch. He peered behind him to check his light wood desk that was cleaned off except for a laptop, a phone, a file, and a pen. There was a square window right next to the desk that overlooked a small bookshelf. The bookshelf contained a small number of books, movies, CDs, and games. His eyes gained focus back on his so-called therapist as he clicked his pen to start the session. So, Seiko Adashiro. Are you comfortable with Seiko-kun? Yes. Right. Let's begin our talk. Mr. Compress really hoped his other seven comrades can find something out. Duo. I love this painting. When we escape, I'm going to take it. Magni frowned over a watercolor painting of cherry blossoms. And where would you exactly put it again? We don't have a home to go back to. Shigaraki remarked snidely at her excitement. Up your ass and to the left, Mr. Grumpy, Magni mumbled as she followed behind Spinner up the stairs. Upon entering the second floor, four of them found their temporary rooms. Nameplates on the doors indicated which room belonged to each person. Mr. Compress, Magni, Spinner and Twice. Wow, my place looks nazzy. It's absolutely hideous. Twice said with his mask still on. He was granted permission considering his mental state. Spinner looked inside his own room, glancing around, it is okay, I guess. Magni looked inside a room, ooh. I do like the decor, but I want that painting to be in here. Shigaraki scratched his neck, can we please move on and forget about the rooms for a second? We are supposed to find something to help us get out of here. The three followed their lead up to the third floor. Only to discover the remaining four rooms for the remaining villains. Gurujiri, Toga, Dabi, and Shigaraki. Oh goody. More rooms. Dabi said deadpan. I believe any information we could gather is mainly on the first floor. I suggest we search for any place we can before time is up. Twice and Toga checked the third floor rooms. Spinner and Magni look at the second floor rooms. Shigaraki and Dobby will help me look on the first floor. Kurajiri explained. They all nodded before heading to do their jobs given. They will find a way out. Even if it meant killing the therapist on the way out. So, how was your life growing up? Izuku questioned him from across the table. Seiko replied, pretty normal. I had two parents, I was an only child. Nothing much to write about. I had a couple of friends that I played with. Sometimes I would host little shows with my toys for my mom when father went to work. I was always a showman, you see. When did it start to change? When I got my quirk. Simple as that. In the middle of class, I compressed my notebook when the teacher asked to see what I was doing. By the time I finished panicking, everyone was amazed at what I did. But the amazement lasted very short when they realized that I could do much more than compress inanimate objects. Can you explain? One time, I stepped up for a victim in front of their bully. They pushed me and I accidentally compressed them into marble. Everyone thought I killed him, but when I brought him back from the prison, it didn't change anything. Everyone saw me weirdly after that. Everyone saw you. As a villain before I was even five years old. Seiko gritted his teeth angrily. I was only a freaking kid. 
I even did it in self-defense, but no one saw it that way. Hmm, Izuku replied, nodding sympathetically. People accused me of stealing stuff from their lockers or bags. When I said I didn't, they wouldn't believe me until I emptied every pocket I had to show them I had no marbles at all. They started rumors about how I caused one of the popular girl's arms to break or something. But you never did. Izuku interrupted gently. Nope, Seiko muttered tiredly. What happened while you grew up? Seiko continued, after that, it was just plain ignoring from people because they didn't want to mess with a boy who could turn them into a marble whenever he wants. My parents were more distant than before, but they weren't afraid of me. What brought you to the decision to join the League of Villains? I was having trouble finding a steady job. I was working part-time at a movie theater. There I was introduced to the vigilante, Stain. I was inspired by Stain and his ideals of a fake hero society. His method of killing to bring out the fake idols that everyone worshipped. I admired that. I don't think so, Izuku said offhandedly. What? Seiko asked slowly at the therapist sitting across from him. It wasn't right to murder them. Okay then tell me. How else would he bring his message? What do you have to say about his legacy? You can't say he wasn't doing it for the right reasons. Tell me truthfully. Hate just brings more hate. I know a lot about how corrupt society can be, but that doesn't give a right to murder. And his principle about fake heroes, I don't get who falls into it. He said only All Might, but All Might rush in without thinking and impulsively saves. Some heroes can't do that and instead have to plan out their moves. He punished Ingenium for a death he didn't even cause. So what do you believe? Izuku smiled warmly that everyone deserves a chance. No matter the quirk, no matter the last. They can be who they want to be. So if I wanted to be a hero? Seiko snorted, raising a brow in question. You would be great at it. Your quirk could do such amazing things for good. Seiko's mouth dropped in surprise, how? It's perfect for the line of work that I already do. It is great for villainy. But you could do so much more with it. Izuku insisted. Like what? Well, you could save people in a that are trapped from fallen debris by compressing them into marble. You could apprehend the bad guys quickly before they got away because I heard that you are very swift in your captures. Seiko interrupted, well, I don't want to be a hero. So where exactly do you think I would fit better except for villainy? You could use your natural star personality and work with something in the arts. You are a showman. Seiko-kun, you could star in plays, musicals, and skits with that winning attitude. You could even use your quirk as a trick if you are doing magic like what a magician might do in. Seiko was stunned as Midoriya came up with several things he could do. He blinked as the other's voice was drowned by his thoughts. He is the first to believe in me. My abilities. He is the one to see right through that. It looks like he can see right through me. As Izuku continued to talk, Seiko continued to listen and add to their conversation. With the time passing, he almost forgot about his comrades outside. By the time their session was done, all the other villains were seated back on their positions on the three couches of the living room, looking exhausted. Hey, how is it going? Izuku asked casually at the unreasonably tired out villains. Anyone want a drink? Can I get a water please? Mr. Compress asked politely. Wine? Kurajiri moaned from his spot on the third couch. He was lying face down with his lightened load of dark wisps floating around his body. The cuffs apparently cut his quirk and cut down some of his wispiness too. Okay. Be right back. Izuku said before dashing inside the open kitchen. Mr. Compress approached his friends with an easy smile on his face. We found something. Spinner whispered from his relaxed position with his arm over his eyes. Seiko's eyebrow rose, what did you find? Izuku isn't a licensed professional at all. Also, Magni wants a painting. Spinner whispered a little quieter. Hell yeah I do, Magni groaned from her spot. Spinner, what are you guys talking about? Izuku asked curiously. Magni wants that watercolor painting. Spinner said nonchalantly. Oh, the cherry blossom one. I painted that actually. Izuku responded cheerfully before handing a glass of iced water to Mr. Compress. I'm glad you like it. Wait. You painted that Magni asked loudly in disbelief. I painted all the paintings that are hung up in this house. Those cherry blossoms came from a palace I was feeling happy. The other ones oh. I don't really want to remember the ones I made from back then. Izuku explained while he handed a tall glass of wine to Kurajiri. Well, I think the cherry blossoms are very beautiful, Magni responded from her seat. Thanks for the compliment. I'll be happy to move it into your room if you would like. Izuku replied happily with a gentle smile. I would appreciate that very much, Magni answered. When Izuku turned his back, she flipped off Shigaraki while mocking him with silent laughter. Ha. She mouthed to Spinner. Spinner rolls his eyes. Hey, are you even a professional? Do you have any kind of license to actually be doing this? Izuku paused after putting the wine bottle back in the drawer. I'm not a licensed professional, but I am qualified to help you all. Abi asked, how the fuck can you help us if you aren't even an actual therapist? 
it was essential that I wasn't a licensed therapist apparently, Izuku responded simply. Abi was even more confused, what? How the foo? It's because you wouldn't actually want to talk to them, would you? And they wouldn't want to deal with you guys. I took the necessary classes to be considered a therapist, but I was taken out of them when Nedzu learned about my analysis. I was going to settle to be a therapist or quirk counselor who could do actual good until that point. Izuku explained. What's so special about your analysis that Nedzu took you out of studies? Kurajiri asked with disbelief. My analysis was covered in 15 notebooks by the time Nedzu heard word of them. In them, I listed everything that I knew about each pro heroes I came across. Hell, the last one was all about villains. Recover Girl actually visited the college to help oversee a medical exam. When I asked for an autograph, she read my notes. After that, she took me and my notebooks to Nedzu, and the rest is history. How much do you really know? Enough to blackmail, bribe, apprehend, and possibly even kill anyone I have information on. I learn their quirks very quickly from any fight online or in real life I see. From there, I break down what their strengths and weaknesses might be. Any weak points or strong points are listed down in that notebook. When Nedzu saw it, he took me under his wing to teach me personally, and that allowed me to make some new friends and gain one back. Are you telling me that you had valuable information on every single hero? Shigaraki asked while scratching his neck up bad. Izuku reminded with a calm grin, and the villain. I still write in those notebooks to this day. The notebooks are actually being used to their fullest potential. Wow, Seiko commented with wide brown eyes. Everyone's jaw dropped. They were captured by a skilled team of pro heroes that somehow found out their weaknesses and drawbacks. Could it be that Izuku's notebooks helped them accomplish that? I'll just set up the painting in Magni's room then. See you in a bit. Izuku called out cheerfully before heading up the stairs to take down the painting from the wall. I'll go next time while you guys go look around for something new. Spinner volunteered. The others nodded while MR.Compress sighed and sat down. I'll be here. Taking a much needed break for myself. Seiko relayed while sipping on his iced water. Ah. Cool and refreshing. Hurijiri took a big gulp of the red wine in his glass. Oh god, this tastes so good. Count me out of this hunt too. I'll be here enjoying every last drop of whatever the hell is in this glass. Oh, great. Dobby sighed in irritation. Spinner and Magni bit back a laugh at how the other two were acting. They all agreed to actually begin the hunt tomorrow, since everyone was tired from the scavenger hunt from that day. I'm back. What's for dinner? Toga groaned out to him. I can make something for everyone. Izuku offered. They all agreed and soon Izuku was off whipping up some quick ramen for everyone. While they ate, the seven glanced at each other, while Seiko chatted with Izuku about learning to cook himself. After they ate, each of them retired for the night. Relatively calm for now. When everyone was asleep, Magni laid awake, admiring her new painting until she fell asleep as well. In the morning while Izuku made cinnamon rolls for breakfast, the villains gathered together on the third floor. Seiko expressed how he'd rather stay out of it for now, before he headed downstairs to watch Izuku ice the cinnamon rolls. Seiko joined Izuku down at the kitchen, while the others talked out their plan. Hey, could you help me learn about cooking or baking something? I want to do something today, you know. Izuku blinked with a cinnamon roll in his hands. Sure. No problem. How about you start with something simple like cookies? Izuku suggested while Seiko took the cinnamon roll out of his hands and ate it. The seven concluded their plan to check the house again, while Spinner is distracting him with his talk. The villains headed downstairs when they caught a peek at Seiko taking notes while Izuku talked about temperature and time. I volunteer as tribute for your next session. Spinner said while getting up from his comfortable seat on the couch. Oh, okay. You go ahead and take a seat. I'll be right there with you. Izuku replied before grabbing a cookbook from a kitchen drawer. Just follow the instructions and you should be set to make some chocolate chip cookies. Seiko nodded which Izuku smiled at before excusing himself to start Spinner's talk session. The villains nodded at each other, Kurajiri's not a little slower than the others. Apparently, the wine was stronger than he thought. Spinner looked around the office while in his seat with Izuku readjusting his clipboard across from him. So, Iguchi Skuchi, are you comfortable with me saying Iguchi kun? That's alright. Okay. Let's begin, shall we? Spinner hoped that this time his friends would actually find something more useful. Whoa. Now that I'm looking at some of these paintings, I'm really wondering why most of these are like really something. I really love them. Twice commented while looking at a particular watercolor that looked to be a flame diminishing in a sea of water made of green. Made of green. Dark. Sad. Depressing. Toga suggested while she looked at a particular one. A painting of a green-haired teen standing still in darkness with a middle school uniform on. Multiple colorful scenes are drawn out above him, very different from the black background he was surrounded by. A scene of two children. One sitting in a stream looking angry at the other who was standing above them with their hand held out. 
another scene with three angry shadows. The last scene was a beautiful sky picture from on top of a school rooftop, with his school shoes right near the edge. Since Izuku made the paintings, the villains checked all of them for any clues as to what Izuku was hiding from them. Shigaraki found himself looking at one that portrayed what he assumed to be the younger version of Izuku wrapped up in a hug by his mother. But he was crying, and she was crying in a dark room only illuminated by a computer screen. Garigiri found one with Magni that looked to be a painting of a middle school student that looked like him standing alone in a classroom. Their uniform looked burnt in certain places, and their cheek had a nasty purple bruise forming. And Dobby seemed to have the only happy painting in front of him. A family portrait of Izuku and his mother. A future one based on the height of Izuku and the gray hairs starting on his own mother. Izuku sat on the couch with his arm around his smiling mother as they posed for the picture. Each of them moved on to checking anything they might have missed from yesterday's hunt, but they each separately wondered about Izuku's past. Why the hell did it seem so sad? Seiko wasn't struggling that much. It's just. What the fuck is the difference between a teaspoon and a tablespoon? Each spoon that the kitchen had was the same fucking size. Did it make that much of a difference? He thought angrily, picking up spoons of the same size. He shrugged before guessing the amount of salt. He poured a cup of white sugar and a considerably less of the amount of salt into the dry mixture. Then he added the brown sugar before sighing. Okay. Now time for the wet ingredients. He thought, turning around in the direction of the fridge. He opened the door and looked inside before he started panicking. Where the fuck are the eggs? Seiko Whisper yelled into the open fridge door. How was your life growing up? It was just fine. My mother raised me by herself when my dad left. And she tried her best to put food on the table and take care of me while working two jobs. Would you believe me if I told you my dad was also absent and that my mother was basically a single mother as well. I could take a guess with how well you cook and apparently bake too. Izuku laughed at Iguchi's comment, so what happened before your quirk and after? Yeah, the quirk is where the trouble always starts sometimes. Nothing unusual happened before I got my quirk. I was always a loner that didn't have many friends or any at all. I mostly had classmates that I saw every day, and that was it. Izuku nodded, and what happened afterward? Well, I was one of the last to develop in my class. Iguchi started, everyone was gushing over how cool their quirks were, or how perfect it would be to become what they wanted to. But when I said I wanted to be a hero, things took a turn with my classmates. They kept saying that it was practically useless. The only thing my quirk does is gives me my appearance and make me able to stick to walls. Iguchi continued with a glare, that's when it started. Kids who didn't really talk to me made fun of my appearance before ridiculing my weak quirk. I was basically ignored by all my classmates besides the talking behind my back. Once I got a love letter only to show up to her and her friends laughing at me that I actually believed that anyone would actually care like that for me. Izuku nodded with a grimace, let me guess. Meet me on the rooftop after school. I want to tell you something. Covered in hearts. You too? Spinner asked in confused disbelief. Several times. Some were girls to make fun of me for actually believing in it, and others were boys who were looking for a punching bag. Geez, Iguchi commented. Yeah. So did the bullying continue? Izuku asked, getting back on topic. Iguchi shrugged, pretty much. It wasn't really severe as physical, but it did wreck me on the inside, you know. Basically made me feel weak and useless for a long time. After years of that, I was struggling to find something to get into. I couldn't be a hero, so what else was there for me to do? I was in between part-time jobs when I found Stain and his whole outlook. Then I found the league and the rest is history. So Stain and his principal. I heard it from Mr. Compress about you saying stuff about it. I just wanted to say that heroes work differently from All Might. Yes, half the time you need to think quickly, and that's where All Might's stance comes in. But when there is a sensitive case to deal with you need time to think it over and suggest the best plan to move ahead, otherwise, the whole thing goes to SH Pool. Izuku corrected himself. Iguchi snorted at Izuku's attempt at censoring himself, so, if you think Stain isn't the right one. Who else should I follow then? Spinner questioned the therapist. You don't have to follow anyone, Iguchi-kun, Izuku said. What do you mean? Iguchi asked. When was the last time you did something based on what you wanted? What are you trying to say? Who are you? Izuku asked calmly. What? I'm Spinner questioned outraged. Are you only the follower, Spinner? Or are you going to make yourself your own leader, Iguchi-kun? Izuku replied gently. It's time for you to make your own decisions. Don't base it on what someone wants from you or what someone else does. Iguchi sat in silence. Damn, Mr. Compress was right about him being good. He thought to himself. Have you found anything yet? Shigaraki rasped over his shoulder to his followers. Nothing in the broom closet. It's very cozy in here actually. You, Dusty. Twice sounded from his spot in the closet. Nothing here, Toga said from her place in her room. But I really do love the red color it's painted. 
I didn't even notice how red it was until I turned on the light. Where's Dobby? Shigaraki asked when he saw no sign of him. I heard he went down to speed up Mr. Compress's baking, Magni responded while still trying to examine the paintings, since she didn't really want to look around. You do realize that Dobby will probably do something with the cookies. Kurajiri deadpan from the side with his head resting in his hands. He. Wait. No. The cookies. Twice yelled out before charging downstairs from the third floor. Then three things happened. Twice tripped on the last step. Seiko screamed at Dobby to not touch his masterpieces. And Dobby rapidly placing the cookies on the counter before revealing what he found hidden away in his own room. Apparently, someone was dumb enough to leave their lighter inside his room and guess what else he found. You'll never guess. Yep, hairspray. Charcoal cookies coming right up. If there is anything I would like to add before we finish, I think your quirk is very useful and handy. Iguchi snorted, yeah, but not hero material, right? I think so. He raised a brow at this, are you being real with me? I'm being serious. The ability to stick to walls is very good for hero work. You can climb into spaces that regular heroes couldn't be able to maneuver. You could climb onto the ceiling or walls undetected and listen in on important conversations for missions. You could rescue civilians trapped by. Iguchi was getting redder by the minute until he smelled something, do you smell that? Izuku pauses in his words to smell the air. He gasped and said in a scared voice, the cookies. They both looked at each other before running out of the room to check on what the hell was happening in the kitchen. Their Seiko was being held back from strangling Dobby while there were several burnt cookies on the counter. What's going on? Izuku asked approaching the two. This son of a bastard burnt the hell out of my cookies. Seiko yelled out, pointing a finger at Dobby. I was trying to make them cook faster. Dobby argued back holding a charred cookie in his hand. You are so lucky that my cuffs are actually holding back what I can actually do. No. I wanted cookies. I'm actually on a diet. Twice exclaimed from the ground, which he still lay face down from his fall. Seiko laughed at him revealing what is in his pocket. He reached in to reveal four cookies unharmed from the fire. I saved some of my cookies, you mother. Okay. Okay. No more cursing in the kitchen. Izuku calmed Seiko down. Dobby, get out of the kitchen, nothing can take your heat in here, Izuku pointed to the now ruined charred black marble counter. Seiko, you go and enjoy your saved cookies, and I will make some dinner. Seiko gave Izuku one of his cookies and gave Iguchi one as well. He gave the last one to twice since he was sad without one. They were all very crispy, but good enough to be edible. But before anyone sat down, Izuku made sure that everyone's cuffs were still on. Dobby and Seiko sat across from each other on the couches while Izuku got dinner ready in the kitchen. The villains gathered together to say they hadn't found anything the second time around. Apart from the old paintings, we haven't really gotten any concrete information, Shigaraki mumbled. We just know he was very sad when he made a lot of them, Magni said to her friends. Dinner's ready. Izuku called from the kitchen. They all looked up to see eight bowls of delicious smelling food. I made my mom's katsudan. Eat up. Everyone drudged up to grab their bowl to eat. When they got their bowl, they all sat down back in their seat. I hope you like it. It was my favorite while growing up. Izuku said absentmindedly while he ate his own in the kitchen. When everyone took their first bite, they each had their separate reactions. Seiko nodded and hummed at the delicious familiar taste of a home-cooked meal. Iguchi smiled at his first bite, remembering the times his mom had enough time to cook dinner for him when he was younger. Gurujiri appreciated the taste, but he would recommend a glass of specific wine with it. Toga groaned, remembering a time she would only dream to have this kind of food when she was living on the streets. Twice loved and hated the food, he didn't know what to think. Abi distinctly remembered a time that his mother cooked dinner for him while his father was out doing work. She was pregnant with his brother at the time. He grimaced but kept eating the meal. When Shigaraki ate the first bite, something spiked in his heart and mind to remember what his own mother was like. What she cooked for dinner for him and the rest of the family. Monchan. Everyone sat down eating a delicious home-cooked meal that reminded them of their lives before all the bad times. In the kitchen, unnoticed, Izuku wipes a tear from his eyes while eating the katsudan. Magni, Shigaraki is very questioning of what Izuku is doing. Why is he so special? He caused two of my members to basically become neutral. Shigaraki thought to himself as Spinner helped Izuku with washing the dishes. Oh, I forgot to ask, Izuku thought out loud while turning to Magni, is the painting in a good place for you? I can move it if you want. Magni smiled at Izuku, I'm all good. Thanks for asking though. Can I ask about a painting? Um, okay. Which one? The one where you are posing next to your dot dot mother I assume. Oh yeah, I made that one last. A recreation of the last photo I took with my mom before I went to college. She was so proud of me for making my way through high school to get into a really nice university. I haven't seen her in a while though, so maybe after all of this is finished, I can go see her. 
Izuku replied, getting wistful at the end by smiling and thinking about the last time he saw her. That must have been right before Nezu took him out and a few short visits in between his new work. With all the work, he hasn't seen her in practically half a year. So, I also saw one with your mother and you while you were super young. Dark room and crying, ringing any bells. Shigaraki asked curiously. Oh, yes, um, that one. That one was when I was young and the whole day impacted my life to what it is now. Izuku started while putting away the dry dishes. What was the day? Toga questioned quickly. Somewhere in July, Izuku replied happily as he closed one of the cabinets. Ugh, Dobby groaned out from his spot on the couch. Well, I'm gonna head up to my room to sleep. Call me if you need anything, or just walk up to the door. Either way. Good night. Izuku called out before heading to his own bedroom. Good night. Iguchi and Seiko called out to him, leaving them alone by the remaining six staring at them. What? Iguchi says in response to multiple stares. Shigaraki sighed, we haven't figured out anything with him yet. There is nothing around the house. We checked everywhere twice. Where could he be hiding things? I don't know. And at this point, I don't care. Can we just take a break from hunting down whatever we can find on him? I'm tired. Dobby groaned out from his relaxed spot on the couch. Okay, well you guys do whatever the fuck you want tomorrow, I'm gonna take my turn, Magni said standing up to move to her own room. What, why? Shigaraki asked. Bitch, I need to rant, Magni replied to her boss. Kurajiri shrugged, you, do you. I'm gonna look through what we have as a food inventory before going to bed. I may just cook something for dinner tomorrow. Whoa, when did Mama Kurajiri come out to play? Toga questioned smirking. Around the same time, they figured out there's more wine to drink. Kurajiri retorted back to Toga, resulting in her giggles. Dobby smirked at their interactions before moving to his own room. Twice folded his arms before focusing on Dobby. When he passed him, he whispered, I got my cookie, bitch. Dobby scowled at him which caused twice to double time it up the stairs. Dobby shook his head at his friend before making his way up to his door. Toga followed after them as Kurajiri took to the kitchen opening cabinets and drawers to find out what they had in this house. Iguchi and Seiko sat next to each other and whispered about their experience with Izuku. He is like a cinnamon roll that you just want to squish, you know. Iguchi asked Seiko. Oh, thank goodness. I thought I was the only one to see it that way. Seiko whispered to him. The next day, everyone eventually came down from their bedrooms. With no real purpose to find some evidence in the house, everyone caught up on some well-needed sleep. Shigaraki came down with the messiest head of hair out of all of their frizzy heads. Except for Magni, she was great with making sure her hair was straight, apart from a few flyaways. Izuku was already awake and preparing eight bowls of cereal. He gave the bowls to each person that wanted either the plain or the fruity sugar kind. Izuku also made sure the coffee machine was on, just in case anyone wanted one. Kurajiri and Dobby took some coffee with their cereal, but everyone else had orange juice. After the lazy breakfast at around 10 in the morning, Magni finished hers first to tell Izuku what she had in mind for today. Hey, can I talk to you today? I need to like get everything off my chest, you know. I need to fucking rant. Magni called out to Izuku while sitting in her spot in one of the couches. Izuku looked up from the dirty bowls in the sink. Alright. Izuku agreed, let me just dry off these dishes and put them away before I head on over. Wait, twice started from his place on the other couch, do you have anything we can do? Like a board game. I hate board games. I have a few games in my office and room. Um, how about Monopoly and guess who? Izuku offered when he remembered what board games they might be interested in. Those sound fine. I haven't okayed guess who, but I'm interested to see how this goes. Iguchi, how about you? Seiko asked his friend next to him. I'll play guess who just to get away from the others playing Monopoly. Iguchi retorted back to him, recognizing the competitive look in Shigaraki's eyes. Seiko replied back, yeah, it's gonna get ugly with them. He took notice of Toga rubbing her hands together in anticipation. No kidding, Iguchi said, eyeing Dobby's mischievous look. Izuku went to grab the board games, while Magni got ready for her rant by standing up and shaking off her clothes. Thank God, our rooms came prepared with clothes to change into or else we will all be stuck wearing the same thing, huh? I'm thankful we have a place to shower, Kurajiri piped up from his relaxed spot on the couch when Izuku came back with the two proposed board games. Alright, Magni, you could go ahead to the office while I set these game up, okay? Izuku offered to Magni as he set down games in a table. Alright with me. As long as I get to talk. Magni called out before making her way to the office at the end of the hall. Izuku set up the games in the table by setting out all the pieces before leaving the manuals into Kurajiri and Seiko's hands. Alright, I'll be going to start the session. You guys have fun. The two looked at each other before looking back at the other five, waiting anxiously for the game to begin. Good luck with Monopoly. Iguchi and I are playing Gesu. Try not to die. 
Seiko said, patting Kurajiri on his back. Kurajiri turned to his designated group and sighed, oh shit. So, Magni, are you comfortable with me referring to you as Magni-chan? Yeah, no problem, Magni answered. Izuku looked down at his clipboard, okay. So pronouns. She, her. Alright, great, I'm just making sure, Izuku added. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Thanks. Now let's get to my rant, Magni said as she got really comfortable on her chair. Alright. Let's begin, Izuku replied back to her. Why am I in jail again? Toga shouted at her piece that once again landed in jail. Ha. In. Your. Face. Twice screeched from his seat. You just wait until I get my get out of jail free card. Toga complained to twice. God I wish there was one in real life, Kurajiri mumbled, earning a nod from the other two. I want to buy Tokyo please. Shigaraki proudly said to Kurajiri, who was in charge of the money. God damn it. How can you already buy property? Are you cheating? Dobby raised his voice at his boss. No, I just know how to play the game. And oh, would you look at that, Shigaraki explained, pointing to where Dobby's metal figure landed, you landed right on my new property. Pay up, bitch. Seiko looked on with Iguchi as Dobby attacked Shigaraki by jumping over the table. Thank god we aren't playing with them. Do you have brown hair? Iguchi asked, directing his attention to his game partner. Oh yeah, Seiko responded. Fucking hell. Did you pick Steve again? Iguchi complained with an eye roll. What can I say? The guy looks just like me, Seiko responded picking up a piece of Steve that almost looked like him. Do you have black hair? No, Iguchi replied, making Seiko put down all the faces with black hair while Dobby tried to strangle Shigaraki. While Toga was dancing on top of the couch with her get out of jail free card in her hand. Kurajiri looked determined to get back to drinking after the game was done. So Izuku started, how was your life growing up? Pretty okay back when I still went by my dead name. Kenji Hikiyashi. I don't consider myself them anymore, I just call myself Magni now. But back then, my parents were so excited about their boy to grow up and become someone worth being proud of. Well, you can definitely say, it didn't turn out the way they wanted it to be. Magni started. I was just Kenji back then, and I started to grow thinking that it was all I ever would be. One time, I asked to get a dress from a nice woman running a shop where she sold handmade clothes, my egg donor was furious and dragged me out. She complained to my father about how I wasn't acting like she wanted me to. My father and she argued a lot back then until she left. From then on, at age 4, my father raised me. Was he alright with who you were? Izuku questioned with a pen to his notebook. Magni nodded, he was confused, but gradually got used to it. He couldn't afford to buy me a dress, but he would bring back any small toy I wanted at the time when he got enough money for it. I had like two Barbies. He was cool with me acting feminine, but he just didn't know about a few things. What about after you got your quirk? Izuku looked up to face the woman sitting across from him. People were just okay with it, I guess. They didn't really know what I could do with it. They just were like okay humans, magnets, opposite gender, attraction with magnets, got it. Magni stifled a laugh, but my quirk wasn't really the reason for everyone's criticism back then. Everyone around me felt things towards the way I acted. They didn't like that I cried to let my feelings out because boys aren't supposed to have emotions. They didn't like when they found out my dad got me a Barbie because boys aren't supposed to play with dolls. They hated the way I was and wanted to force me to be something I wasn't. My quirk always came in handy to propel my bullies away into some unsuspecting people. When I first did it, I felt so much better not hearing their nagging voice near me anymore. When I got old enough, I moved out and changed my name to Magni. There I created a name for myself and eventually found the league. I got nicknamed Big Sis. They treated me better than any others, Magni finished with a sniffle. Izuku offered her a tissue which she gladly took. Oh god, thanks for letting me rant. I feel better. Kind of, Magni replied to Izuku who was waiting patiently with a tissue box, a gentle smile on his face. No problem, I'm always here if you need to talk, Magni-chan. I'm like the number one support. Izuku offered kindly to her. Oh please, call me big sis. Ha. Magni offered gratefully to Izuku. Izuku smiled softly at her before she continued on about her journeys after she moved out. Many great stories of how she found people like her before she gained a reputation for her own. Magni sighed, I just became a villain, but even if this whole thing works out, what will I do? Well, you told me about how you used to think about working with your friend during the night scene, so maybe there. Izuku offered up, thinking about things she could do. But I just don't want to live paycheck by paycheck. I'm okay with it, but I want to find something else. Like get a nice apartment, maybe a cat and Magni let off. What is it? Izuku asked curiously. I want to find love, isn't that cheesy? Magni retorted, slightly laughing at herself. No, I think finding love would be amazing. Someone to cherish and accept you for who you are. Someone to love you until the end it's like a dream. Izuku responded wistfully. 
yeah. Maybe if we all get out of here, if this whole thing works out. Who knows. Maybe I could find someone out there for me. I think that could definitely be accomplished. Izuku complimented before hearing a crash from the living room. Ah, crap. Here they go. Come on, let's see what they broke this time. Magni groaned before leading her shocked friend out the office door. Let. Me. Go. You overgrown toddler. Dobby complained deadpan while Shigaraki held him by his shirt. Hey hey. What's going on? Magni complained as she strolled into the living room to see what was happening. She paused and looked around when Izuku came up behind her. Seiko and Iguchi were having a lovely time, relaxing with their new round of guests who with a glass of water by their side. But on the other side of the room twice and Toga took bets between who would win, while Kurajiri was trying to find the strongest alcohol he could in the kitchen. Shigaraki had Dobby in his grasp. He started it. Shigaraki complained over his shoulder. He was just whiny about not winning the last property. Dobby yelled back at her while being slightly suspended in the air. Dobby was taller than Shigaraki, but Shigaraki gamer rage fueled him to at least pick up Dobby a few inches off the ground. Hucking put him down Shiggy. Geez, I leave you guys for what 20 minutes? It's actually been two hours, Seiko replied lazily from his own calm game. You took a long time in there. Oh really? Well, that doesn't give the excuse to act like children. Come on, guys. Magni complained while Kurajiri found a bottle of whiskey in the cabinet. Uo, come to Mama Jiri, Kurajiri praised the brown bottle of liquor. I'll be in my room if you need me. I'll try to get rid of the major pain they caused in my head. Wait, Kurajiri, we have pain relievers you don't need to drink. Yeah, he's not listening, Izuku started to say while Kurajiri charged upstairs. Meanwhile, Magni separated Dobby and Shigaraki from each other. Izuku noticed the silence and decided to break it, so what do you guys want for dinner? Shigaraki's head on a plate, Dobby complained with his head in his hand. I'm sorry I don't cater to cannibalism, Izuku apologized while Shigaraki looked offended. Dobby chuckled a bit while Toga and twice launched into full-bellied laughs. Shigaraki stayed silent when Magni clapped a hand around Izuku's shoulder. I'm feeling like Soba. Come on, I'll help you whip it up quickly, Magni offered to lead the way to the kitchen. Izuku followed behind with an excited smile. Kurajiri. After Soba for dinner, everyone went to bed with their stomachs full, even Kurajiri who had his supper delivered to him in his room. But the following morning, Kurajiri was having some trouble, hangover troubles. Kurajiri moaned, ugh. My head. I told you that we have pain relievers, you should have listened. Izuku fretted as he replaced a wet towel on what he thought to be Kurajiri's forehead, breathing a sigh of relief when the wet towel didn't fall through the light mists around him. Next time, you wouldn't need to have this major hangover. Yeah, I get it now, Kurajiri mumbled with his yellow eyes narrowed into a pinch from the huge headache he had. Izuku sighed before continuing to take care of Kurajiri while the other villains hung out in the living room downstairs. Would you mind if I wish to be the next one in your session? You know, after my headache is completely gone and my hungover state is vanished. Like later today or tomorrow, just when I won't feel like the room is spinning anymore. Kurajiri asked looking up to him with his piercing yellow eyes. No problem. I will gladly talk to you when you are feeling better, but for right now, I'll help you with this whole situation. Izuku responded. Thank you Midoriya. Kurajiri thanked him gratefully, placing his wispy hand over the wet towel on his head. Izuku smiled kindly, please call me Izuku or Deku if you want. If you wish, Izuku, Kurajiri said politely before groaning with his hand pinched to his temple. They both nodded in respect to each other before Izuku continued to make sure Kurajiri was comfortable. Meanwhile downstairs, Shigaraki was growing more upset that he hasn't found anything on Izuku. Shigaraki rasped while scratching his neck, is there anything we can find on him? Anything at all. Doga shrugged, I have no fucking clue. At this point, I'm tired of looking and coming up with nothing. Dobby scowled, I can only guess that his office where he conducts the whole session things is where he hides the stuff we are looking for. Twice, replied with a hum, that makes sense. You lost me. Shigaraki glared, that might be true. The only place we haven't checked is inside that office since he is always there. How are we supposed to get inside since every session takes place there? Toga asked right before Izuku appeared at the bottom of the stairs. Hello everyone. Izuku greeted with a smile before starting on lunch. Hi. Hey, where's Kurajiri? Seiko asked as he approached the kitchen to see what Izuku is making. Oh. He is staying in his room right now. He has a major headache amongst other things, but he will be all better by tomorrow. That's good to hear. Hey, what are you making? Seiko asked Izuku while Shigaraki had an idea. If Kurajiri has a hangover, this could mean good news for us, Shigaraki stated. Why? Twice questioned in a curious tone. Shigaraki paused in his neck scratching to say, after Kurajiri gets out of his hangover, he will try to stay in his room as long as possible, even after getting out of it. 
which means that Kurajiri can distract Izuku for enough time with whatever upstairs while we hunt in Izuku's office. Solid idea, but when do we do it? Dabi asked. Tomorrow. Kurajiri doesn't get over his hangovers fast, but they always wear off by the next day. All we need to find out if Kurajiri is the next one to have their session. If he is the next one, he would want to stay inside his room. When that happened, we make our strike. Shigaraki grinned at his plan. Okay. So all we need to find out if Kurajiri is next. Toga asked. Yeah, Shigaraki said simply to her, causing her to turn around to face Izuku. Hey Izuku. Toga called out. Um, yes. Izuku asked hesitantly. Who is the next on your list for therapy? Toga asked curiously. Oh, Kurajiri was just telling me that he would like to be next. So the day after tomorrow would be the next open available time for anyone else. Izuku answered. Okay, great. Toga yelled out to him, causing him to flinch at the loudness before turning back to her leader. So, tomorrow. She whispered softly. Shigaraki nodded, tomorrow. Seiko laughed at Izuku's joke about bacon, followed by Izuku's own bubbly laughter. Magni and Aguchi joined them in the kitchen to help out with breakfast. Time will tell when they finally strike. The next morning, Izuku came down from his room to get breakfast ready for the others. One by one, they came down to enjoy a simple meal of toast with eggs with some bacon on the side. They each enjoyed their meal, especially the four who planned on having some real fun when Izuku was gone. Izuku walked inside his office to the staring eyes of the other four villains. When he walked out into the living room, he started to tell others what he planned to do that day after breakfast. Izuku said while getting a small notebook and pen ready, hey guys, I'm going to go talk to Kurajiri in his own room since he is more comfortable there and I don't want him moving too quickly. Oh, no problem. Seiko replied while he sat on the couch next to Iguchi and Magni. We are going to teach Magni about guess who while you are gone. Iguchi pointed a look at Seiko while smiling, yeah, if she doesn't pick the same person each time, right Seiko. What's with the look? Seiko responded, snickering from remembering the fact that he picked the same guy four times. Have fun, Izuku. Magni called out, also, what about some pizza for dinner? That sounds good. I'll get to work on that after the talk with Kurajiri. See you guys soon. Yes, see you soon, Shigaraki mumbled watching Izuku disappear up the steps. Seiko, Iguchi, and Magni went to grab Guess Who at the table where they last out the board game. So, where should we play? Iguchi asked the others, looking over to the other four that looked sinister. I vote for one of our rooms because I don't want to be around them if they start playing Monopoly again. Good point, Seiko replied before leading the others to his own room up the stairs. Toga looked behind her to the other three seated on the couch, it's the time. Okay, are you comfortable? Izuku asked while settling on the chair right next to Kurajiri's bedside. Kurajiri looked over with a teacup in his hands, yes the pillow behind my back is very cozy, and this tea you prepared is very lovely. Izuku smiled happily, thank you. Now, are you okay with me referring to you as Kurajiri-kun? I have no problem whatsoever. Kurajiri shook his head before taking a long sip of the warm lemony tea. Izuku clicked his pen, great, then let's begin our talk. What are we supposed to be looking for again? Toga whimpered, replacing the pillows she had thrown off the couch while she was looking. I don't know. Twice Whisper yelled as he ducked his head to look on the bottom bookshelf. Shut up and keep looking, Dobby complained while searching through the closet off to the side. Why does he get to have the video games? Shigaraki pouted at seeing some of his favorites out of his reach the whole time. Shigaraki sighed and scratched his neck, tilting his head to reach a particular spot. When he tilted his head, however, he noticed one of the bottom drawers of Izuku's desk was slightly cracked open. Shigaraki smirked and thought to himself, time to see what he has been keeping secret. Okay. Do you have red hair? Seiko questioned looking up at Magni. Oh shit, he's onto me Magni thought as she looked up at her friend. Yes. Seiko asked with a raised brow, are you Sarah? Yes. Magni replied slowly before pouting, you are too good at this game. Thank you very much. Seiko thanked her with a proud tone in his voice, he even stood up and took a small bow in confidence. Oh really? Seiko, you better be prepared. Iguchi challenged as he took his spot replacing Magni. So how was your life in the beginning? Gurujiri began, well, my parents didn't exactly plan to have me. It was a simple unfortunate accident that caused them to try to hustle things around for my entry into the world. In the beginning, they tried their best to work with each other to raise me, but it was too difficult for them. They barely knew each other before the night I was conceived and I was their only obstacle from separating. They began to realize that I was the cause for all of their misfortune. From my sperm donor not being able to get back together with his love and my egg donor not being able to go back to university. They settled into the mindset of believing that I was the cause of all their troubles that made them have to get jobs to support the cost of me surviving. Gurujiri said staring into his teacup before taking another sip. Again, lovely tea. What is this? 
Kurajiri asked in curiosity. Izuku blanked before decompassing himself to answer, just a little lemon rose tea mix. It's very good. Kurajiri complimented. Izuku blushed slightly before saying, thank you. Um, so what happened afterward? Kurajiri sighed, they figured out they didn't need to give me attention, care, love, or any nurturing at all. They just started to ignore me. Sure, they gave me food and water, but my roof was the empty pantry with a ratty old mattress pushed against the wall. When other kids had birthdays celebrating their births, my parents became slightly angrier when my own would come around. I would only know if it was my birthday from the amount of drinking they did in the living room. Would you tell me about your experience when your quirk came in? Izuku questioned, looking into Kurajiri's relaxed yellow eyes. Kurajiri started, well, the experience of living at home just worsened. They looked down and disgusted me when I would talk about wanting to save people by warping them away. They started to ridicule me and how I wouldn't even have the strength to save others when my power obviously belonged to someone like a villain. I, at least, didn't have to worry about taunting from classmates since I had no classmates. I self-taught myself at home and from the public library a street away from my old childhood house. When bullying did come, it was in either their drunken angry ramblings or by the more popular flashy quirked kids at the public park I would see while passing by. Gurujiri answered, staring down at his wispy hands. I had no one but myself and the books. Not one person was on my side. Once when I was seven years old, I genuinely believed that maybe I could be a hero. And? Izuku prompted. Gurujiri looked at Izuku with a resigned face, look where that got me. Seiko asked in playful confusion at seeing his character getting found out yet again, how did you find out I was him? Because you play him almost every single time. Iguchi yelled in frustration, bringing his head down onto the game board. Oh, yeah. You're right. Seiko apologetically said to the exhausted looking Iguchi. Shigaraki picked up a large folder packed full of loose paper from the overstuffed drawer. Hey, guys. I think I found something. The other three gathered around the desk to find Shigaraki slamming the very heavy folder onto the wooden surface, making a loud thud when it made contact. What's in it? Toga asked earning a shrug from twice. I don't know but I'm about to find out. Dobby started before opening the folder open to show the overspilling contents inside. Shigaraki stared with the others as they stared into their own faces. With a file on each person in the house, they expected him to have their personal files, but not what they found hiding behind the documents. When I was a teenager, around middle school age, I desperately looked for a job to get out of the house. By this time, they started to act unruly towards me, causing me to sleep in the park for fear that they might hurt me. But no one would hire me since I didn't have any education on my resume. When I tried to tell them about my circumstances and how I was homeschooled, they didn't listen and threw me out on the sidewalk. From there, I met Sensei. He guided me up and took me away from the hell house I had into a secret bar. Then Tamura was chosen and the story continued. Kurajiri finished off before downing the last gulp of tea. Izuku took the teapot and refilled his cup as well as his. If it is worth it, I just want to say that I don't think your quirk is villainous at all. Really? Yes. You would have been a great hero. I might have become one of your biggest fans. Oh, that is quite a shame, Kurajiri chuckled before asking, is my quirk really that useful? Of course it is. Everyone who said no was not looking at the many ways you can do with it. You could rescue people in a flash when they are stuck underneath rubble or right about to fall off a building. You can be redirecting quirks back to the bad people who use them. And with a more normal trick, you can become a great show-stopping bartender with all kinds of cool tricks to mix the drinks. Gurujiri laughed wholeheartedly at Izuku's kind words. Thank you. I think I can say you are the first one to say my quirk can be used for something more than just a getaway warp ride. Gurujiri continued to talk to Izuku for a long time. Just talking about anything that came to mind, he felt really comfortable talking to him. Gurujiri started to say, hey, if we get out of this place. When? Izuku offered. Ha. Hey. When we get out of this place, you wouldn't mind if I wanted to do more of this. Talking and catching up? Kurajiri asked. I would love to do that. We can meet up at a coffee shop whenever we are free and talk about our week and things. Izuku added happily. Gurujiri suggested, that sounds like a deal. It is. We will meet and continue to listen to the other's stories. Izuku agreed with a gentle smile. I would like to ask you something, Kurajiri stated simply. What is it? Izuku looked up to see Kurajiri's questioning stare. Did my room come like this? Kurajiri asked, looking around his beautiful room. Izuku laughed before starting to explain, no, you see. Izuku smiled with Kurajiri as he helped him down the stairs, just in case. He was so excited to make pizza for dinner for the rest of the group. He turned to go into the kitchen before the presence of the agitated four made themselves known. Izuku went to greet them before noticing a pile of papers on the desk. His eyes widened when he noticed what exactly the papers were. Notes. 
Notes on all of them in disturbing length amount of detail. Each file on everyone had at least 5 pages of notes. I. I thought I already told you guys about my notebooks. This is what I do, I'm sorry if I offended you in some way, I didn't mean for anything like that to happen. Izuku apologized, seeing that the notes might be considered by them an insult in some way. Oh no. You don't get to play the innocent act. What with all these extras notes? Huh? What's with all these words about unstable, need to fix it up, make it better, or my favorite one everything needs improving? What is all of this? Dobby brought up, picking up one of the papers and reading the highlighted notes. No, no. That's not what you actually think that is. Izuku tried to counter when the other three came down the stairs from the noise. Oh, really? Then what about this? What gives you the right to tell us to fix our lives when we have no clue about yours? What do you actually know about us? You don't know the full extent of anything they have been through. You don't understand what it was like for us. Shigaraki whispered threateningly, getting really close to Izuku. Hey, what's with all the noise? Iguchi asked before landing his eyes on the scene before him. A pissed off team of four against a sad looking Izuku and a mostly calm Kurajiri. Before anyone could react to Iguchi's question, a sound of skin hitting against skin echoed through the air. Everyone watched as Shigaraki's clenched fist aimed at Izuku's face once again. Kurajiri acted fast by holding Shigaraki down to the floor, while the others went to restrict the other three from moving toward the hurt Izuku. Calm down, Tamura. Kurajiri reprimanded Shigaraki, trying to make him stay on the floor. You saw the notes. Tell me I wasn't acting like you would have acted. Shigaraki raised his head from the ground, unapologetic. Kurajiri's yellow eyes narrowed, you don't know the real reason. Now stop. Let me go you, lizard brain. Dobby complained loudly, trying to kick at him. Hell no. Iguchi yelled out, holding Dobby's arms tighter behind him. Izuku, are you okay? Magni asked, slowly trying to approach the shock still the green-haired person who helped her. Toga was held in her strong arms behind her, surprisingly calm about her position. From Magni's sudden question, the others focused their attention on the nearly forgotten therapist that just got hit in the face. Izuku didn't respond as he slowly raised his hand up to the pain on the right side of his face. He pulled back his hand to see a faint imprint of blood from where Shigaraki's fingernails scratched him harshly from his loose fist. Izuku? Iguchi asked, holding Dobby back from trying to pry Kurajiri's arms off of his hold on Shigaraki. Izuku stayed silent, staring at the blood on his hand for a long time. Are you alright? Seiko asked, holding twice away from the scene much to their anger and happiness. Izuku didn't look away from his hand, watching the small droplet of blood start to slowly fall down the lines of his palm. He was still silent, barely moving from his spot. Izuku, please say something. Kurajiri pleaded, restricting Shigaraki from getting up and hurting Izuku again. Izuku's green eyes seemed to glow in the dim lighting while staring at his hand before they landed on the fallen Shigaraki. Izuku approached quietly, his footsteps making the only noise in the room. He stared straight into his red eyes with boiling anger and irritation. Izuku started to smile with a sad twisted way from the side of it, you really want to fucking know about my life? Izuku asked with a tone that they didn't recognize at all. Izuku has never been like this. Oh shit. Izuku, my life started off just fine. I had a father, a mother, and best friend whose parents I would call my uncle and aunt. Everything was just great. Izuku started off. Izuku's smile dropped into a frown. Until I got my quirk diagnosis. You see, everyone got their quirks, my best friend being the first in the class. Then, one by one, everyone got theirs. Which left me and my mother to go to the doctor to see what my quirk would be. Surprise. I don't get one. I'm part of that 20%, fellas. I'm quirkless. The doctor tells me straight away to give up on my little hero dream. My mother is trying to make sense of all of this. Son of a bitch dad took a job overseas, so he wouldn't have to deal with his son. Sure, he sends that money as basically child support, but he has never once tried to contact me at all during the time I fucking needed it. And my mother, she tried her best to cheer me up from the worst news that I got. So I asked my mother, playing the video that inspired me to be a hero that I might not ever become, if I could become a hero. And she didn't say what I wanted her to say, that I wanted to hear. I just wanted to hear from the one person who supported me to actually say that I could be a hero. She said, I'm sorry. Izuku chuckled bitterly at himself. Then when I went back to school, I get nicknamed Deku. Deku which basically means that I'm useless, worthless since I don't have a quirk. Given to me by my best friend, but guess what? I still hung out with him. How can you believe it? Then, I tried to help him out when he simply fell down, but he took it as an insult and started to bully me. When he wasn't bullying me directly, he was attacking me when I stood up to him to protect someone else. I got beaten down each day by my so-called best friend. The teachers didn't do anything when they saw his behavior. They simply didn't want to harm their golden child's reputation. 
who cares if he burns through my clothes, making me hide first degree burns from my own mother at the age of six. Izuku asked the stunned audience he had. Izuku's eyes started to tear up while his face showed off his rage, and don't get me started on complete strangers' reactions to me being quirkless. Oh boy. Those fucking dicks. They whisper to each other about my disability and say how they feel so sorry about how my mother having to raise me. My classmates talked and laughed behind my back about me being so stupid to actually believe that I could be a hero. People thought it was funny to give fake love letters to me just for me to show up and for them to laugh in my face. Sometimes I would even get beat up when I showed up. People only see my worth if I have a quirk. But guess what? Since I didn't have a quirk, I was thrown to the side. Do you want to know about those paintings I painted them to get my feelings of self-hatred, depression, anxiety, and all my feelings of wanting to just go away? Izuku stated matter-of-factly, pointing up to where his paintings are displayed. My best friend turned bully threw my notebook out the window after hearing that I wanted to go to the same high school as him. He burned my shoulder while threatening me to not go anywhere near his school and that I better not even try to apply to get in. And then he told me if you want to get a quirk, jump off the roof and pray for one in the next life. Do you know I actually considered it? Actually considered just jumping to end my life. Fucking Kakazuku took a deep breath, his cheeks were already wet with tears. He sighed, rubbing his eyes to get rid of the falling tears. God. Before Izuku could say anything more, he cut himself off. Sorry, I'm just wasting your time. He looked to the kitchen, gesturing towards the cabinets. You have enough food, fend for yourselves. I'm just going to try and not die up in my room. Izuku walked away quickly from the scene in the living room. Leaving all eight of them in shock from what they just heard. When Izuku was almost to his own room, Iguchi and Magni started heading fast behind him to console him. Seiko joined in their plan to comfort him after shooting his old boss a nasty glare. Gurujiri has his arms folded against his chest, glaring the other four down as they stood silent. Shigaraki had enough of his dirty look. Why are you standing up for him while he has been taking notes on us? Shigaraki asked, scratching his neck in agitation. For our bedrooms. Kurajiri started simply, with a tone of hidden venom behind his words. What? Twice asked confused, tilting his head. He took specific notes for him to personally decorate our rooms so we would feel more comfortable while this hell has been going on. The whole need to fix comments with our files was reminding him which room he needed to fix up. Dot dot what? Dobby asked more quietly than the yelling accusations from before. Yep. He made sure everyone felt more comfortable while we were basically forced away from society. He told me when I asked about my room. Kurajiri picked up his own file with the words everything needs improving. My room needed to have more improvements than the rest of yours, but only small ones for each furniture piece. That's why. Unstable was for twice his bed frame that had one of its legs shorter than the rest. And make it better was for Toga's painted wall, it apparently needed several coats to get the right color. Before they could make a comeback, Kurajiri confused, in fact, he made sure we had certain aspects that we liked or contributed to our quirks in some way that would make us familiarize with the room as more of a home and not a prison cell. You know, the prison cell that he is trying his hardest, his best, to make sure that we don't end up in. And yet here we are now. Are you proud of yourself, Tamara? Kurajiri glared one last time before following the others to where Izuku headed to leaving the other four silent in the living room. Shit, Dobby mumbled angrily. Yep, that what I'm feeling like now. Twice replied with a hand to his forehead. He let out a big sigh before placing his head in his hands. I feel bad now. Like he must have painted our walls all by himself, since no one would want to help out with the villains, huh? And he did a great job with the blood red walls in my room, especially with the dripping pink at the top. Toga added mostly to herself. I really like it. Shigaraki stared in silence down at the floor. He didn't know that Izuku. Oh fuck, now he feels bad. Izuku stayed up in his room for the rest of the weekend. That night on Friday, the four ate together while the other four went back up to share with Izuku. The eight were pretty separated from each other. On Saturday, Kurajiri watched over Izuku most of the time while the others dealt with the silence in the living room. The four twice stood up to talk to the other three. Twice turned to look at Seiko and Magni, look. We all feel bad about what happened yesterday. So? Are you going to apologize anytime soon? Twice looked back at the others. Dobby and Shigaraki didn't meet his eyes, but Toga glanced up. I can say. Not you. Him. Magni rolled her eyes, pointing at Shigaraki. It's mainly your fault for doing that shit. You all need to apologize, and you all can. But Shigaraki is the one who needs to say sorry the most. Why? Shigaraki mumbled, scratching at the sofa cushions. Why? 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 Fuck you. He is trying everything to make sure that we were alright. We never did the same for him. And he Magni yelled at them before Seiko stopped her with his prosthetic arm. Seiko shook his head, don't try. He won't even get it. 
It's not worth wasting your breath. Magni scoffed and walked away from them, heading back to her room. You need to learn what is up soon. Or else. Iguchi said before going up to Izuku's room to check on him. Shigaraki, learn quickly, Seiko stated simply, throwing back a glance at his former leader. That Saturday night each person stared up at the ceiling of their rooms wondering where everything went array. Seiko sat down on his bed, resting against the tan wooden headboard. He sat on top of Burgundy's comforter with grey sheets and pillows, softening his spot. The cool blue floor almost exactly the shade of the amulet he wore around his neck. With his head in his hands, he looked upon the bookshelf in the corner. It had books about magic, mystery, and endless tricks. There was also a stereo on top of the small bookshelf with a library of CDs from musical soundtracks. Iguchi laid down on his stomach reaching one of the books from his own personal bookshelf about abstract art. He had already picked up the one on martial arts and the art of being a ninja, but he was curious about why this art book was chosen to be in this room. His walls were a calming shade of green. His comforter was a lovely shade of dark green with a pink sheet. Magni laid down in her light brown sheets covered by her soft pink comforter. The cool frilled white pillows underneath her head, providing her a nice place to rest. Her cherry blossom painting in full sight with its beautiful colors even lighting up the room late at night. The light brown bookshelves aligned with romance novels, a few by Jane Austen. The walls were painted a nice cream shade that complemented the hints of pink around the room. Burajiri sat down on his white wine red bedsheets with a glass of wine in his hand. The small bookshelf under his window was filled with books about wines around the world, types of drinks you can make, and one in particular on how to make disgusting shots. His walls painted a deep purple with a nice white trim. Why sat cross-legged on his black comforter with grey sheets and white pillows. The small bookshelf near his bed contained books about overcoming fears, facing inner monsters, and a multitude of empty journals. There was also a handmade box of popsicle sticks that had jokes on them sitting on top of the bookshelf. Helga sat down on the corner of her bed with a pink heart pillow squished in her arms. Red for the color of the bed. Her bookshelf was about blood. Well, there covered nursing, but it included blood. There were magazines of the kind of clothes she wants to wear, all kinds of cute creepy clothing. There were also some books on how to crochet and knit yarn into cute animals and accessories. Abby lowed with his head resting on his hands while he laid down on his dark purple comforter, with a blue bedsheet peeking out. His walls were painted a dark blue with accents of light blue, reminiscent of his fire. The books on his shelf were art books with famous paintings, sketches from famous people, and art from tattoo artists. Shigaraki laid away clutching a dog plushie to his chest, it reminded him of Monchan. His comforter was light blue with white pillows. His walls were painted a muted blue with grey trim. He laid awake, looking over to the books that were in the corner in his room. Books about doing ceramics and pottery as a hobby. Izuku lay awake, thinking over what he did. He didn't mean to lose it like that, but he was just so frustrated, and hopefully, tomorrow will be a better day. Shigaraki finally decided. He was going to apologize just to bring the broccoli head back for the other four. Shigaraki thought back to the similarities that they shared with their backgrounds. Nobody was there for either of them. And look how differently they turned out. He sighed to himself, placing his hand on his face. Here we fucking go, I guess. He mumbled to himself, going downstairs to join the others for the late morning. He headed downstairs ready to find the others, but not expecting to see a very tired looking Izuku resting on the couch. The seven of them looked up at him when he came down the stairs. Gurujiri gave him a look, the others apologized already. Shigaraki sighed, nodding his head. He turned his attention to Izuku, I am sorry. What? But I went through the files and started assuming things. I was a bit on edge that you might be just like the other ones who didn't care. Hmm. I can see where you are coming from. I accept the apology if anything else to stop all these angry vibes around the house. I also apologize for disrupting everyone's time with my rant. Izuku smiled weakly, gesturing towards a video game that he set on the dining table. You guys want to play Mario Kart? The villains looked at each other and nodded. How the hell is he so good at this game? Shigaraki angrily mumbled to himself, staring at his fifth place on his split screen. Izuku had his tongue stuck outside his mouth, focusing on the game with his car in the first place. Years of practice inside my room, Izuku responded just as quietly to Shigaraki. Yes. No. Why? Twice shouted at the screen. Ha. Did you slip on a banana that you threw the last lap? Toga wheezed between fits of laughter. Shut up. Twice shouted, trying to quiet Toga's laughter with a pillow to her face. Abi watched the three go at it on the TV screen, meanwhile, a thought ran through the back of his mind, who was Izuku protecting? Whose name did he leave out of his story? Dobby wanted to ask, but the look from Iguchi stopped him. I guess the rest will figure out sooner than later the information on who told Izuku to kill himself. The Mario Kart Championship ending up with Izuku as the winner. 
Kurajiri decided to bring out the alcohol to celebrate and to also make the others relax. Izuku certainly brightened up after a few drinks of tequila. Dobby was impressed on how much the small green haired could drink. When Seiko asked about his high tolerance, Izuku laughed and said it was from his mother's side of the family. But even Izuku had a limit when his cheeks were red, but his face was somber. Izuku giggled, stupid Kakin. Who the hell is Kakin? Dobby asked, wondering who that childish nickname belonged to. You know, he was kind of a dick. He threw my notebook out the window, that bitch. Izuku grumbled, swallowing the last of his small drink of tequila. Shigaraki's eyes widened, so did everyone else's. So this Kakin is the one that caused most of Izuku's bullying. Ha. Huh. He tried to go with Lord Explosion Murder for his hero name. Ground Zero sounds better than that middle school email name. Izuku mumbled happily, laughing to himself at his own little joke. Unaware of the villains plotting revenge on a certain blonde hero. We kidnapped him once, we can do it again. Shigaraki scratched his neck. Oh. You are worried about Izuku, admitted. Magni whispered. Shut up. I'm not soft. Shigaraki rasped. Gurujiri raised his eyebrow at him. Really now? Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day. Bye.